chance to visit the Russell Museum. We have not yet uh, reopened to the public. We plan to do so in January. Uh, the museum is nearly 10 years old. Um, but this is actually not the building I'm going to be talking about today. Instead, it is this one. So I'm sure um, most of you recognize this building. It is what we now call the Bullfinch Building uh, at Mass General Hospital. And this is a photo from September 1st when hospital leadership uh, celebrated the anniversary of the admission of the, um, the 200th anniversary of the admission of the hospital's first patient. And not only did it involve the unfurling of these lovely banners, but also some other commemorations and a virtual tour, um, parts of which I'll be showing you in a moment. Um, but first to back up a little bit, um, to talk about how the Bullfinch Building and how Mass General came to be. So uh, in the early 1800s, and again, I'm sure many folks in this audience know a lot of, a, a lot of these details already. Um, there were no general hospitals in Boston. There were only two in the US, one in New York and the other in Philadelphia. There were a couple of specialty hospitals, such as for soldiers or sailors, but no place for the common person to walk in and get care. And one of Mass General's maybe not entirely unsung, but undersung heroes, is a minister named John Bartlett, who worked at the Alms House, speaking of Alms Houses, here in Boston. He was a really um, versatile, intelligent guy. He studied some medicine himself to try to help serve um, the, the people in the Alms House better, um, but he realized it was just too big a job for one man. And he entreated some of his well-connected um, friends in Boston to um, try to get support for the idea of a general hospital. And two of those friends were a physician named James Jackson, and the other was a surgeon named John Collins Warren. And Warren in particular, I'll be returning to. So in 1810, Warren and Jackson write a letter to their friends and neighbors to get support. And in 1811, um, the uh, Massachusetts legislature grants a charter for both Mass General and for what was then called the McLean Asylum for the Insane. Uh, so that's why you see the year 1811 in all of um, our logos that are on campus currently. However, the following year is 1812. The War of 1812 slows things down for a while. And it isn't until I think 1816 that an architect named Charles Bullfinch is hired. I'm sure all of you are familiar with his name from Boston history. He had already uh, designed a number of um, sort of, you know, state like government buildings and stately private homes, but he hadn't designed a hospital before. So he visited those two extant general hospitals and a psychiatric hospital in Baltimore for inspiration. And then he came back and sent a report to the trustees to say that it should be this grand granite edifice in this Federalist style, as you can see these Ionian columns on the front. And also um, he proposed what were at the time relatively advanced ideas about heat and ventilation for the, the health and the comfort of the patients. So uh, the cornerstone is laid in 1818. And by 1821, the building isn't completely finished, but apparently finished enough that the hospital can admit its first patient. And that first patient is a saddler, someone who made saddles and other uh, leather goods, who had syphilis, which was a pretty common ailment at the time. And as I'm sure you all know, uh, there was no cure at the time, just treatments that were pretty terrible in themselves. Uh, this here is a, a combination of a modern day photo of the Bullfinch building and an engraving 
that shows what the uh, sort of the the very edge of the bullfinch lawn looked like at the at the hospital's beginnings. Um, we don't know whether this particular first patient arrived on foot or was carried or was came by carriage or by boat. Um, part of the reason why the this particular parcel of land was chosen was not only its proximity to the rest of Boston by road, but also um, its situation next to the Charles River. And if you're ever in the main corridor of the hospital today, heading toward the smell of coffee at Coffee Central, you look down, sort of to the right and down, there's kind of a sorry hole in the ground now um, where you can see the, the last remnants of this wharf that was here, where they brought both patients and goods. So uh, 1821, uh, they admit their first medical patient, but they are also awaiting um, their first surgical patients. And here is where we get to uh, the, the story that I'm sure many of you already know. Um, and so for that, I'm just going to toggle over to our virtual tour here. Um, So this here is the original operating theater of the hospital. Um, just out of curiosity, for those folks who I can see on my screen, who has been to the Ether Dome? Okay, some have, some haven't, thank you. Uh, so this was the hospital's only operating theater for many decades. Why did Bullfinch to choose to design it in this way? Um, he might have been inspired by the operating room in Philadelphia, which was also in a lovely, under a lovely dome like this. Certainly inspired by the need for natural light. Um, surgeons needed every ounce of light they could uh, to see what they were doing. And the third possibly apocryphal reason was so that the cries of people undergoing surgery would be carried up and out and would be less audible to the patients and the staff below. Um, and as I'm sure everyone has figured out by now, the reason for that was because anesthesia did not yet exist. Um, to return to Warren, uh, he was not only the co-founder of the hospital, he was also the head surgeon. And surgeons at the time were skilled for their speed um, that was the utmost um, uh, need, and precision wasn't much of a possibility. Warren could supposedly amputate a limb in 40 seconds, and he wasn't even the fastest uh, of his time period. So what makes this particular operating room so famous? Um, the history of uh, people experimenting with uh, gases for anesthesia and other, um, other materials for anesthesia um, extends way, way back. But for the purposes of our story, I'll start with a dentist in Hartford named Horace Wells, who used nitrous oxide, what we all know today is laughing gas, um, on himself and his patients, and it seemed to work. So he came up to Boston, rented out a public hall, um, and demonstrated on a dental patient. We don't know exactly what the problem was. Maybe the dose was too low, but it appears as though the patient cried out and the people in the audience jeered humbug at him. So he gets laughed out of Boston, but at that time, he has an apprentice and business partner named William Thomas Green Morton, who has been experimenting with ether. <clears throat> Morton has both the advantage and the courage um, of a friend at Mass General who he asks uh, whether he can uh, arrange uh, a demonstration on a surgical patient here in the operating theater. And he's granted that chance on October 16th, 1846, which is just a hair over 175 years ago. 
so not only did the hospital at large celebrate uh, a big milestone this fall, this fall, but so did the Department of Anesthesiology, um, which held a pretty spectacular symposium about everything that has happened in its field here since then. So anyway, um, I'm going to just turn us around to narrate the next part of the story. Um, and Ashlyn, do feel free to signal me if I'm going on too long. So this is a depiction of um, what happened on October 16th, 1846. I'm sure many of you are uh, familiar with the Hinckley painting, um, which had been hanging at Harvard Medical School. Um, and that was painted, I think maybe not quite so long after. Um, this is more of a, a much more modern painting from 2000. Um, and it depicts um, in as historically accurate a way the artist could through research, um, who was there that day and where they might've been positioned. So Morton is the one holding this glass globe with a sponge in it. The patient that day is a young man named Gilbert Abbott who has a malformation on the floor of his mouth and the side of his neck that will involve some relatively straightforward suturing. And Warren is the surgeon. So Morton uh, administers the ether. Abbott appears to fall unconscious. Warren begins the surgery. However, Abbott does make sounds and move around. So they're not certain until the surgery is over whether the ether has worked. And Warren asks Abbott, did you feel any pain? And he said something like, did the procedure begin yet? And to which Warren said, well, do you mean you didn't feel any pain? He said, well, I felt a dull scratching on my neck. And so with that, Warren turned from his patient, who was probably about here, to the crowd in attendance and said, gentlemen, this is no humbug. And with that, he put his stamp of approval on the discovery and word of it traveled very quickly for 1846. Um, it also sparked a controversy that I don't have time to get into today, but the all of the threads of the ether story are, are pretty fascinating. Um, I, I can't leave the ether dome without, um, without talking about Patty Hershef quickly. Um, why is there, why are there the mummified remains of an Egyptian, an ancient Egyptian in an operating room in Boston. Back in the 1820s, there was a Dutch merchant who bought the entire burial ensemble in Turkey, uh, gave it to the city of Boston, um, probably for political favor. And then the city, knowing that the hospital was still quite new at the time and could use more money, gave it to the hospital as a fundraising tool. And so the hospital sent Patty Hershef out on tour um, by boat of different cities and towns along the East Coast, and people were charged 25 cents admission to look at him. And then when he was done with his tour, <clears throat> the, uh, the trustees deemed him an appropriate ornament of the operating room. And he has been there almost continuously ever since including for the demonstration of ether in 1846. So um, the ether dome ultimately saw more than 8,000 operations, um, but then went out of service. I always forget the exact date, late 1870s, early 1880s, when um, an OR that was um, more up to sort of sterile standards um, than the ether dome was. And then had a series of uses after that, storage, but also uh, a nurse's dining room and even a nurse's dormitory for a while. And that is where I will um, mention that the hospital launched a school of nursing in 1873. 
And student nurses not only worked here in the Bullfinch building, they dined here and they even lived here. Now I'm gonna just take us down the stairs just to give you an idea of what these wards, these open wards that nurses and physicians looked like at the time. So much of the building now, sort of nice offices, cube land like this. So it's really fascinating to see what used to be here. Oops. So this is an open ward from 1880 um, in what is now um, near the compliance officer's <laughs> office. And then just down the hall, I'm going to show you Nineteen sixty-three. So there's the addition of curtains, but there's still open wards at the time with a nurse's station in the middle there. Now, um, so patient wards moved out. I think the last one was early eighties, and this is where one of the the nurses on here will be able to say the exact uh, year. I'm sure. Um, but the Bullfinch building sort of maintained uh, its, its relevance in, in all kinds of ways. Um, I'm going to show you just one of a couple of labs that are in the Bullfinch building, surprisingly. It's interesting to see um, these sort of modern research labs trying to kind of be retrofitted into these um, weird spaces in this old building. This is in the Gordon Center for Biomedical Imaging. They work on radio tracers. Um, and when we came around with this 3D camera, uh, one of the principal investigators said, oh, let me show you something I found in the fume hood here um, back when I came to Mass General a few years ago. So it's actually a can of ether, um, not from the 1840s, but um, maybe from the 1980s or 90s, um, used before 93, um, that might have been used in animal experience, experiments by the lab that was there previously. So of all things to find, it was can of ether. All right. So um, something else that I wanted to show you is that this even though the, the, the building is largely um, administrative offices and regular cubicles, there are still really interesting nooks and crannies. This one is actually in the suite of um, the Senior VP of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion on the first floor of the Bullfinch building. Um, this is really cool um, vaulted closet. And one of these vault closets might be the site of the first x-ray taken in a Boston hospital. Um, and here is where we can pause to talk about uh, another pretty interesting figure in the hospital's history. So Walter Dodd, who you see here, um, started off as the hospital's apothecary. Um, he actually had no formal training at first, he had been a janitor in a chemistry lab at Harvard, um, but he was a quick study in um, making all the preparations for classes and so on. He became the apothecary at Mass General. And then um, the apothecary at the time was kind of a catch-all of a number of different um, uh, uh, needs, including supplies, what we would call materials management now. And when word of um, Röntgen's x-ray came along, he decided to experiment with it. And he ended up becoming just the de facto radiologist at the hospital and really earned the respect of, the, um, of all the MDs around him. And I should note too, um, about re when it comes to research, um, Mass General is known for its patient care and its 200 years of patient care, but also it's a real powerhouse 
um, in the research world. It actually has the biggest hospital-based research budget in the US at about a billion dollars. And the few labs in the Bullfinch building are a mere fraction of the many, many labs that are both on main campus and also in the Navy Yard in Charlestown. So I just wanted to um, just show another fun juxtaposition. This is actually in the um, infectious disease offices. Um, my colleagues poured over countless floor plans and other materials from the Mass General Archives to try to figure out what existed where, when, and came across some interesting stories along the way, including the fact that this used to be what was called the accident room, kind of the early emergency room. Uh, and uh, house pupils, or what we now call uh, medical and surgical residents, were allowed to pull teeth. So if they were called to, um, to pull a tooth, this is where they did it. And similarly, the house people's dining room was, was in that same area. And lastly, to go up to the, the second floor here, this room has had a number of lives. Most recently, it's called the trustees room. And it looks like just a fancy conference room. We have James Jackson here, one of the co-founders at this end. We have John Collins Warren here at the other. But just to toggle back to my PowerPoint real quick. This is the perfect example of, of how the Bullfinch building remains central to the hospital's missions. So the Bullfinch building, back when it was built, was, you know, the only grand granite ed edifice around for quite a long time. And, you know, in the ensuing decades and centuries, other hospital buildings have mushroomed around it. And it's almost hidden among these much taller buildings. But because administration and other um, important offices are still in there, it's still, um, I think it's safe to say, sort of considered the soul of the hospital. What you see here is the trustees room using, being used as the incident command center. Um, whenever there's a crisis, the trustees room becomes this center. And the person at the head of the table here with the earrings is the incident commander. Her name is Anne Prestipino, another person who will be going down in Mass General history. Um, this was well before the universal masking policy, before distancing and so on. Um, this was a meeting early on in the first surge last year um, with folks um, sort of planning. So there's the chief of infection control, there's the chief nurse, there's the head of the ICUs, and a number of other people all at the table um, in one place trying to prepare for what was to come. So I, I know that I've given, I've only skimmed over the history here, but what I, I hope is that I have um, given you at least uh, um, the, the desire to learn more. Um, this top URL here, russellmuseum.org slash bullfinch tour, will allow you to go through the tour yourself. Um, and it includes a number of videos as well. Uh, there is a former hospital president talking about an escapee from the nearby Charles Street Jail who tried to break into the chairman's office. 
Uh, there is an anecdote about um, some poor medical intern trying to carry a crash cart up the stairs because he didn't understand what floors things were on and so on. And also, um, uh, the most recent issue of Proto Magazine uh, was a special issue devoted to uh, the 200 years. This this links to just one article, but you can get to the rest from here. And if you um, explore one or both of these things and find that they're really compelling stories that we've missed, I would be glad to hear from you. Um, and this here is my, uh, my email address at the end. So thank you very much for the opportunity and for the opportunity to show off um, all of this, this cool work that we've been doing. Thanks a lot. Ashton, you're muted. Thank you. <laughs> I, I did the video, but I didn't do the mute. Um, thank you, Sarah, so much. Um, it was fabulous to take a little virtual tour because uh, I have never been to the museum um, yet. So I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully January, uh, maybe reopening time uh, to come in and, and visit. So um, thank you very much. And um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop those into the chat. Um, I do have one question off the top, um, historic preservation, thinking about uh, the history and significance of the the Bullfinch building. Um, I'm curious, uh, I'm assuming it's probably on the National Register of Historic Places, um, but I'm assuming if there's ever been, uh, wondering if there's ever been conversations about, you know, tearing it down and building a more high-tech hospital, as you said, you know, there's lots of you know, interesting configuration for offices and such. Has there ever been a discussion about that? I hope not, but <laughs> um, curious. Yeah, I mean, at least at least not um, in in my time here. Um, so I can tell you that both the Etherdome and the building at large are on the National Register. Um, I think that any any notion anyone might have had about tearing down the Bullfinch Building itself has maybe been um, ameliorated by the fact that there's gonna be a very large new building actually built right, right across the street from the museum, um, which unfortunately will ne necessitate tearing down some, some other buildings. Um, but uh, yeah, not, not as far as I know. I don't know if anyone else uh, happens to, to know of any such, um, any such thoughts. Oh, um, it's a beautiful building. So, <laughs> yeah, um, we did have a few other questions here in the chat from Jason. Um, in what year were African Americans and Caucasians integrated on the wards? So that is a great question, and that's actually something um, you might or might not be surprised to know that we're still trying to figure out. Um, at least in uh, Warren's time. Um, it's been unclear um, what the spoken or unspoken policy was. Um, we do know that um, you know there were some African Americans who were traded here, some who were turned away. There, um, Scott might know more about this, but there is um, a story which we don't know whether it's apocryphal or not about Henry. Um, sorry. Bigelow. Henry Bigelow. Henry Jacob Bigelow. Uh, Henry, Henry Ingersoll Dodge. Ingersoll Dodge. Sorry. <laughs> I get my Henrys confused. Um, about uh, threatening to quit if a Black patient um, were to be turned away. Um, there's a lot of, so at least in um, trustees minutes and, and other records, there's a lot of coded language about, you know, it wouldn't be convenient to discuss this at this time. So we still don't have a full picture of, of how many African Americans were treated and where. Um, okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, another question from Myron. Um, what building in Philadelphia inspired Bullfinch? Yeah, so um, I believe that that is also still there. I think it is still Pennsylvania Hospital, um, which at least a long time ago did run tours now and then, but I've unfortunately not been there. Um, so I think it, it was the original um, Pennsylvania Hospital that's in downtown Philly. 
Any but I don't know questions? if that particular building has a name. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Well, if not, thank you all so much, uh, Sarah, thank you. Um, and please, I would love to, to tour the Russell Museum. I'm sure many of the folks in the audience here will, would as well. Um, so thank you so much for joining us tonight um, and taking on a, on us, uh, taking us on a virtual tour. So fabulous. My pleasure. Thanks thank for you. having me. Thank you. So um, that concludes our presentation end of the, <laughs> of the evening. Um, we're going to now move into our um, annual meeting um, and we're going to kick that off. Um, Al, if you'd like to introduce Outbreak and uh, we'll kick off with our Outbreak students as well. Thank you, Ashlyn, and thank you, Sarah. That was really very well done, very nicely done. And um...